John, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, let me get this started. Uh, since coming to Texas back in 1973, I waited 45 years for somebody else, anybody else to translate Lynn Hammer's book. And no one seemed to want to do it. So I gave up and uh, did it myself. Uh, since this is the Lindheimer chapter of the <clears throat> Native Plant Society, I thought I'd sort of change things around and tell you everything I know about Lindheimer. Uh, but I also want to get to his book and the things he said in his book. Uh, one of the things that struck me about Lindheimer's life was that uh, the number of different things he did as uh, to uh, put money on the, bring money into the family. Uh, he was a teacher, he was a fruit peddler, he was a rum distiller, he was a uh, coffee plantation overseer, he was a mercenary, he was a soldier, he was a farmer, then he was a plant collector, then he was a newspaper editor. And another thing you need to keep in mind, one of the things that Lindheimer said is, you may think that our actions are not simply guided by excuse me, our actions are not simply guided by simple thoughts and wills. Chance, or rather the power of external events and even diverse secondary events also have a great influence on our actions. And that's gonna to come to play many times during Lindheimer's life. So let me get started. Is that gonna go down? Do I have control? All right, let me check to see what's going on here. There we go. Uh, Ferdinand Jacob Lindheimer was born on the 21st of May, 1801 in the free imperial city of Frankfurt am Main in Central Europe. This is what Frankfurt looked like in the mid 1600s. And I've had one person ask me, well, by Lindheimer's time a year, a century and a half later, wouldn't the skyline have changed? And I think, well, yeah, probably, but not by much. The main church you see in the center is the Kaiser Dome and the spire rises 312 feet above the, uh, the plaza in front of the, the church. And there was no building taller than the Kaiser Dome in Frankfurt until 1961. So for three centuries, this was essentially the skyline of Frankfurt. And I wanna blow up a little bit of this in the center. The old bridge is on the right. And as you can see, uh, there's a tower at the end of the bridge with a, a, a gap in the middle at the, at the street level. These are fortified gates. Uh, they're sometimes referred to as tours or towers, but more often they are forte, P-F-O-R-D-T-E, fortified towers. And they were uh, able to, if there was an attack, uh, plug the hole that uh, you see people walking through. Just to the, all around the uh, perimeter of the walled city, there were several other towers. There's one here on the left, to the left of the, of the dome. There's a little one closer toward the uh, uh, bridge that seems to have some steps up to it and a recessed uh, level going into it. And it, because it was so small locally, they referred to it as a fort, a little fort, fortified tower. The second fortified tower, uh, just below the, uh, the, the Kaiser Dome, as you can see, the embankment has got stonework between the, uh, the land and the river, but there is a ramp breaking the, the uh, stonework. And you can even see a, a man on a horse riding up the ramp. That's gonna come into play in, in a minute. Uh, Ferdinand was the youngest of four children, all boys. Uh, the parents were Johann Hartmann Lindheimer and Janetta Magdalena Lindheimer, maiden name Reiser. Uh, the father's occupation is listed as Kaufman, which means merchant. But nowhere does anyone tell me uh, what kind of merchandise he dealt in. His father before him was also uh, listed as a merchant. But before that, there was a change. If you follow the paternal ancestry of the Lindheimer family, 
that's the father of the father of the father of the father and so on. Lenheimers were in Frankfurt from uh, about the middle of the 16th century, that's about 1550. And from then until Lenheimer's great, great grandfather, Lenheimer, every one of them was listed as Metzger. And a Metzger is a butcher. So Lenheimer's family was, comes from a long line of butchers. Um, but this is a Dutch painting. It was one of the, the cleanest and uh, most aesthetically uh, pleasing of the, of the images of a butcher shop that I could find. Uh, but in Frankfurt, uh, there's some differences between what you see in this Dutch painting. For instance, uh, just above the cow's head, there's some fish. And in Frankfurt, fish were never sold at butcher shops. There was a whole alleyway of fishmongers uh, in, in, uh, separate from the uh, butcher shops. Also in this painting, it shows uh, chickens over here on the right, lower right. And in Frankfurt, all the, ch the poultry sellers were uh, consolidated into one place called the Huner Mark. And they sold chickens, uh, ducks, geese. Uh, German people love their geese, at, especially it's at uh, Christmas time and probably some pheasants. So a butcher shop in Frankfurt dealt primarily with red meat uh, animals, uh, cows, pigs, sheep, goats. Uh, yes, Germans do eat uh, horse flesh or they did in the 60s when I was there and probably some hares or rabbits. But in addition to being butchers for two centuries in Frankfurt, uh, two of Lindheimer's ancestors were elected to the town council of Frankfurt. And as I mentioned, Frankfurt was a free city. That meant that they had been granted the right of self-determination, uh, free of, of subservience or, or paying tribute to any uh, uh, monarch, such as a king, uh, a grand duke or a prince. Uh, but standing for election in Frankfurt was not like going downtown and filing the papers and then campaigning all over the city for votes from all people from all walks of life. First of all, only men of property could vote, uh, meaning you had to own a building or a land to, to be able to vote. And secondly, the town councils were actually controlled by the trade guilds. And so it's, it's sort of a testament to the Lindheimer's family standing among the trade guild of butchers that on two occasions, one of the Lindheimer's was chosen to represent the trade guild on the city council. Now, this is what the city council looked like in the 1600s. This is what it looks like today after restoration from the, uh, 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 after World War II. Um, this is a, a plan of the city of old part of the city of uh, Frankfurt. Uh, during the uh, actually this was made in the 1890s, I believe, late 19th century and blowing up the area around the Kaiser Dome. You see to the left of the Kaiser Dome, the Hooter Mark, that's the chicken market. And over here, the first uh, place where a street comes down to the quay or the quay. Um, is labeled Grossa Fischer Gasse. That means the greater fishmonger's alleyway. And you see the narrow little uh, establishments on either side of this, this street. Those are all very tiny fishmongers. And the opening, the, by 1890, the, uh, the, the wall had been taken down, so there is no wall being shown. But the, the opening is labeled as uh, uh, the fish, Fisher Fort which is the Fisher's uh, Gate. And that was this little short one that I pointed out in the uh, blow up of the, the first image I showed you. The second gate over here is, was known as Metzger Tor or Metzger Fort. And that's the butcher's uh, gate. And this was the one that had the ramp just below, just below the, uh, the gate. Um, Let's see, I've skipped over something. Uh, in addition to being butchers and uh, occasionally uh, members of the city council, toward the end of that two century period in the uh, late 1600s, early 1700s, Lindheimers were also uh, listed in their occupation as fee stoke handler. That means livestock broker or livestock dealer. And so in addition to being a regular butcher, 
the Lindheimers were branching out and becoming the middleman that would travel up and down the river, gathering the, the uh, animals for uh, that were going to be taken into town on market day and then handling the sale of them and then getting the money back to the, the farmers. These darker buildings here were not built until like the 1870s. Before that, there was a wide open area that had the, uh, the funny sounding name Ander Metzgerfort, which just means a plaza at the uh, uh, butcher's gate. And the animals were herded in through the butcher's gate and the, the plaza on market day became like a mini stockyard. Um, you know, animals, just a couple of animals per enclosure, the low gates, the butchers would come down, bid on the animals or buy them outright and take them to the Schlacht house down here to the left of the butcher's gate. That's the slaughterhouse. And the street just in front of the Schlacht house is the Schlacht house Gaza, which is the uh, butcher house alleyway. And just above that, is the Metzger Gaza, and that's the butcher's alleyway. And if you look at the entrance where the butcher's alleyway comes out to the plaza, there is this tiny little, uh, if you can see my pointer, tiny little uh, building right here on the corner with a bigger building to its right, and then a, a fairly good sized building on the left. And one of the wonderful things about the internet and Wikipedia is you can find an image of almost anything. This is the entrance to the Metzger Gass Gassa, the uh, uh, butcher's gate in 1790. And here's this tiny little narrow little house or building, whatever, the bigger building to the right, bigger building to the left, very narrow alleyway and virtually everyone Every um, building on this alleyway were, were occupied as butcher shops. And in traditional, uh, uh, the tradition uh, in Europe at the time was the proprietor of a shop and his family lived in the apartments above the shop. So the family would have occupied the, at least one of the levels above the shop. Uh, eventually, Lindheimer's father died. I have conflicting reports of when he died. Um, the, the standard biography of Lindheimer uh, in, the, uh, in English uh, has the father dying, um, excuse me a minute. Uh, when Lindheimer was a, still a very young child, but I've gotten, uh, I've run into three sources very recently, two on the internet and one in a printed form in a book printed in Germany in, 18, in 1905 that indicates that uh, uh, Johann Hartmann Lindheimer, Ferdinand's father, lived until 1822, 23, or 24. But eventually uh, the father did die and by law uh, throughout Europe, uh, even in England, as anyone who's a fan of Jane Austen novels or movies knows, uh, property could only transfer from the deceased to the deceased's eldest son. Younger sons and daughters had to fend for themselves or marry rich, unless there was a provision before death where the father set up a, a, um, a fund for the younger sons or the daughters as a dowry or as a, 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 a patrimony. Uh, there is evidence that, that Lindheimer did collect a patrimony before he left Europe, so that may have been the thing. But in the meantime, Lindheimer's oldest brother took the family business, the family home, um, the, uh, uh, became a man of property with some uh, degree of uh, influence in the affairs of his city, and um, was in control of any trust funds for the uh, patrimonies and was able to be the head of the family telling his three younger brothers how to live their lives and where to go to school and what to do about their careers and whether they liked it or not. In the, uh, in the meantime, uh, Lindheimer, uh, after a period of informal education in his home, started his formal education at the gymnasium in Frankfurt. A gymnasium is the, um, 
German equivalent of both an American high school and a community college. And at this point, he is going to go on to university, but at this point, I have to back up and explain to you some of the external factors that Lindheimer was talking about that influenced his life. Um, by the time he is in the gymnasium, he's a teenager. Uh, going back and forth to school every day. He is interacting more with people in his community, and he may be aware of major events in European history that were happening about the time, and well, during his whole lifetime, but about the time that he was in the gymnasium. So backing up to the beginning, I said that Ferdinand Lindheimer was born in the free imperial city of Frankfurt am Main in Central Europe. I, you may notice I did not say he was born in Germany because in 1801, there was no place on any contemporary map of Europe labeled as Germany in whatever language, Deutschland, Alemania, whatever. Um, instead, there was uh, the city of Frankfurt was one of about 300 independent and sovereign states making up the Holy Roman Empire. Each of these states had its own ruler, its own laws, its own coinage, its own taxes, its own import export uh, tariffs and duties, its own weights and measures, systems of weights and measures, and either a standing army or a constabulary that is a police force whose role it was, job it was to enforce the ruler's total and absolute authority over his realm or his state. And for the hereditary monarchs, they would probably add total and absolute and God-given authority over their realm. So that, as you can tell, the, rem the empire by this time was totally dysfunctional. And in any event, by the, before, about four months before Lindheimer turned four years old, the empire ceased to exist. And its demise was not due so much to the fact that it was dysfunctional, because it had been dysfunctional for three or four centuries and probably could have you know, uh, bumbled on for another few decades, if not to the end of the 19th century. But as the 18th century ended and the 19th century began, the empire and every major state in Europe, as well as most of the minor states were at war with France. Now, to be fair, the coalition allies brought the war to France by invading it first. But once the French got the knack of it, they started to expand territorially. And they decided that they wanted to export the French Revolution by way of military conquest, annexation, and uh, establishment of, of, of uh, puppet states, client states. Um, this policy was continued, at least the policy of expansionism was continued by Napoleon once he took over, but because he wanted to be a monarch, he ended up being an emperor, and there was less emphasis on the ideals of a democratic government, uh, popularly supported with voting, voters, and a constitution that would uh, control the absolute powers of, of monarchs. Uh, nevertheless, at the same time, uh, Napoleon forced the termination of the Tolly Roman Empire. He occupied the German uh, Rhineland from the North Sea all the way to Switzerland and inland uh, eastward to uh, Bavaria. And he did away with most of the old states, re rearranged them, gave one of the states to the new states to his brother-in-law, others to generals and the uh, a, a newly created uh, Grand Duchy of Frankfurt was handed over as a hereditary fief to an aging Arch Bavarian archbishop. Um, in spite of the fact that the Napoleonic Wars, as they're generally referred to, began in 1792 and lasted until 1815, longer than America has been in uh, Afghanistan, a 23 year period. And in spite of the fact that there were theaters of war during this time in Spain, Italy, Egypt, Russia, uh, and on the high seas in the Atlantic and Mediterranean, in the East Indies and West Indies, uh, most of the major, most of the battles of the Napoleonic Wars, the whole period of time, 
in, in definitely the most major, most decisive battles of the Napoleonic Wars took place in the northern part of Central Europe, not far necessarily from Frankfurt. As, as soon as he occupied the Rhineland, he stationed or bivouacked, Napoleon stationed or bivouacked a reserve army force that varied between 20 and 30,000 people just two miles south of Frankfurt, where they could be quickly deployed to battle fronts as needed to the north, east, or south. And many times the citizens of Frankfurt during this period could hear the, the cannon fire of uh, a battle not too far distant. And from the time Lindheimer was four years old until he was 14 years old and going to the uh, uh, gymnasium, every day on the streets of Frankfurt, there were French soldiers, either on guard, on patrol, or on leave. Eventually, Napoleon is defeated at Waterloo, but I have to stop here and point out one group of soldiers from, uh, that uh, fought for Prussia that will have a very significant effect on Lindheimer's life. In 1812, the military high command <clears throat> of Prussia authorized a Prussian major, a Baron Lutzov, <clears throat> to recruit and train an all-volunteer army, essentially a mercenary army, from all of the minor states of Central Europe, not just from Prussia. He did this. He, uh, many of his volunteers were uh, farmers. Many of them were clerks and artisans. But also, many of his volunteers were university students. <clears throat> Although they had a uniform that they, that they had to develop themselves because the Prussian military didn't have the funds to give them uniforms, they had a uniform in which they used to fight in conventional battles. The, Lutzow's, the soldiers of Lutzow's Freikorps, as they came to be known, were trained in guerrilla warfare and were positioned behind French lines to disrupt anything they could, supply lines, uh, uh, sleep cycles of, of the French soldiers in their, in their encampments, uh, doing anything they could to, to destroy the French morale during the war. Of course, when they were doing this, they were in civilian clothes. Now, the German peoples knew the soldiers of Lutzow's Freikorps for their bravery, their gallantry, but most importantly, for their sacrifice. Because in 1813, as Napoleon was getting ready he hoped to once and for all knock out Prussia as a, as a rival. He uh, was in Northern Germany and he had to, uh, had to agree to an armistice that lasted all summer during 1813. So he could make certain that his supply chains and his horses, he had lost 80,000 horses the year before in a disastrous campaign in Russia um, were sufficient to do the, the work of, of knocking out Prussia. Once the armistice was declared, one entire company, about 100 soldiers, of Lutzow's Freikorps found themselves behind French lines in direct violation of the armistice. They tried to get home to safety of the, of the Prussian lines, but were captured. And the French commander of the, of the company, of the uh, soldiers that captured them, knew who they were, knew they were soldiers, but he had them summarily executed without trial as spies because they were not wearing uniforms. This tended to galvanize the German peoples of all, of, all the minor states against the French. And if you look up the city of Jena on Wikipedia or Jena University, uh, most, of the most of the soldiers in that particular company that was sacrificed had been students at the University of Jena. And if you look them up, look up Jena or the university there on Wikipedia and you go to Wikipedia Commons and look at pictures of the university or the city, most of what you will see will be plaques, stone markers, monuments and even murals to the individuals or groups of soldiers sacrificed by the French on that day in 1813. So Napoleon was defeated in 1815. 
exiled. And Lutzow's Tricor, the, the uniform parts of Lutzow's Tricor, participated in the Battle of Waterloo. Like I said, they had to develop their own uniforms. And since the, they were only using their civilian clothes and they had to dye them all the same color, the only color that could cover up all the different colors of clothing they had was black. So they wore black from head to toe. And this is a, a, an officer, so he has red on his epaulets, but most soldiers just had uh, red piping around the collar and red uh, rank uh, uh, insignia of rank on their sleeves. Plus, down the front of the cloak were two rows of the cheapest uh, buttons they could find, which were Pretty brass good. buttons, which are yellow. Yes? Hello? Um, finally, in 1815, after Waterloo, the uh, crown heads of Europe met in a Congress in Vienna to put together all of the uh, uh, treaties that had to be uh, made to, to end the war. And what appeared, they redrew the map of Central Europe. They did not reconstitute the old empire, which had been dominated by Austrians for centuries. Instead, they created something called the German Confederation. Uh, now, you may think this is the same map I showed you before, but it's much simplified. Instead of over 300 independent and sovereign states, there were now only 41. And the German Confederation was governed by a federal assembly that met in Frankfurt, right about here, making the free city of Frankfurt no longer imperial, uh, the capital of, of the German Confederation. The Federal Assembly passed laws, but there was no head of state and no branch of any kind of, 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 of the um, executive branch of any of government in the German Confederation. The implementation and enforcement of the laws that the Federal Assembly passed were up to the individual states. And if an individual state didn't want to inf uh, implement and enforce a particular law, there were no consequences. So it ended up as a patchwork of laws and very ineffective uh, uh, control and rule. Um, so it was just as dysfunctional as the empire before it. And, but it was a dysfunctional by design because all 41 of these states had signed the treaty creating the, the confederation. The King of Austria distrusted the King of, King of Prussia and the Kings of Bavaria, Württemberg, Saxony and Hanover distrusted both of them and each other. Nobody wanted a single ruler over all of them. Down here to the left, well, let me pick up on uh, Linheimer again. After, uh, ah, I got a new blow up here. After the gymnasium in Frankfurt, uh, Lindheimer attended a preparatory school in Berlin, the capital of the Kingdom of Prussia up here in the Northeast, uh, after which he enrolled in, a, the, in the University of Wiesbaden in a small town about 25 miles west of Frankfurt uh, in the neighboring Duchy of Nassau. Now, I don't have dates when he did this, but he later transferred to the University of Jena where all those uh, students had been sacrificed in the Lutzow Freikorps. And I don't have dates when he was there, but he didn't stay long. He ended up going to the University of Bonn up here in the uh, North Rhineland province, newly acquired by the uh, Kingdom of Prussia, newly acquired after 1815. And he was there the longest period of time. At the University of Bonn, he received a, uh, a scholarship in philology, which is the study of languages. And one researcher <clears throat> who claims to have seen a list of courses taken by Lindheimer at the University of Bonn reports that most of the courses he took were in various aspects of Greek and Roman literature. And it being the early 19th century, I have no doubt that the texts that they used were in the original Greek and Latin which tells me that Lindheimer was comfortably fluent in both languages. Lindheimer also took many courses in German literature, in philosophy, and in uh, German history. Now, in spite of the fact that one source says that he did sit for his exams, 
no one else reports and not even Linheimer reports any degree earned by Linheimer or bestowed upon Linheimer from the University of Bonn. Nevertheless, by 1827, he is back in Frankfurt teaching at a private school, uh, the uh, Bunsen Institute. Uh, named for its founder and owner, George Bunsen, a cousin of the man who, the chemist who invented the Bunsen burner. George Bunsen would later in life become uh, the superintendent of schools for St. Clair County, Illinois, from which position he greatly influenced the reform of uh, American education system. Now, back to the functioning of the German Confederation. Shortly after uh, uh, it formed in 1815, surviving uh, veterans of Lutzow's Freikorps that went back to the University of Jena decided to have a festival of German unity. Only about 500 people attended, but it was well uh, covered by the press and it was talked about all over Germany. And this was too much for the uh, prime minister of the kingdom of Austria and the prime minister of uh, Prussia. And so they got all of the states uh, in the confederation to agree to um, um, laws on censorship. And because the students before they had their, their uh, uh, festival, for German unity, form, first formed a fraternity for that purpose at the University of Vienna, the first such fraternity uh, anywhere in Germany, that the censorship laws passed by the uh, Federal Assembly and, and in, enacted and enforced by all 41 states, the first thing it did was to outlaw fraternities, student unions, and any other student organization that might even remotely uh, uh, consider uh, German unification or uh, democratic uh, reforms of government or anything like that, including um, student singing groups because they might sing songs about German unity. And German uh, student singing groups were all the rage in the late, late 18th century and early 19th century, so they were gone. Second thing that censorship laws did is they allowed the uh, ruler of each state to fire any teacher or professor accused of seditious teachings, teaching about democratic reforms, the, uh, universal suffrage, constitutional government and German unity. And if there was too much sedition at the school as a whole, the ruler had the authority under the censorship laws of shutting down the entire school. And whenever anybody lost their uh, position, teaching position, because they were fired directly or because the school was shut down, under the censorship laws, they could not be employed as a teacher or professor anywhere else in the German Confederation. Not only were they, would they find themselves unemployed, they were, they were unemployable. Then, of course, the censorship laws cracked down on newspapers and book uh, publishers. And they even uh, censored uh, uh, public speeches. Public speeches had to be approved by the censor censorship office. And in Northern Prussia, uh, during this time, there were even periods where uh, uh, priests and preachers had to have their sermons pre-approved or they couldn't deliver them on Sunday. Um, once, Lindheimer was teaching uh, starting in 1827 in Frankfurt. Down here, there's a, a, a thing, uh, as you see, a light green called uh, KGR Bayern, same color as this area over here. This is all Bavaria. And this area down here, southwest of Frankfurt, had been a part of Bavaria since the 1300s, but it was never attached to Bavaria. It was always remote. And because of that, it was badly administered and badly managed. Uh, the local authorities could not, uh, even if they knew somebody was going to break the law and hold a, a, a rally for German unity, they couldn't do anything about it unless they 
uh, notified the Royal Palace in Munich down here, 300 miles away, uh, and then got, got specific directions what to do, came, come back to them in, in this, the Rhineland area over here. Um, this was in a day before there was, you know, telephone, telegraph, television, internet, trains, or anything like that. Just a man on a horse, 300 miles with a piece of paper in his pocket uh, in both directions. It took a while to get directions from, the, uh, from, from Munich. In 1832, once again, surviving veterans of Lutzow's Freikorps decided to have another festival uh, on German unity down here in the Bavarian Rhineland, about 50 miles southwest of Frankfurt. They told the local authorities it was going to be a simple country fair. They lied. They had uh, pamphlets and uh, handouts uh, printed up and distributed for 100 miles around, plus posters put up uh, telling people their, uh, the, exactly what they intended. The uh, German historians believe there were between 25,000 and 30,000 people who attended the Hambach Fest in May and the 1st of June, uh, 1832. What they got was a series of rallies, demonstrations, marches, speeches, and lectures on democratic government, universal suffrage, and constitutional governments. And on the final day, there was a day long debate, not whether Germany should be united, but how Germany would be united, what form of government it would have, and who would be the head of state, King or Kaiser. Uh, during the Hambach Fest, there, the, the veterans had especially invited survivors of a uh, violent revolution in Paris in 1830 that had been uh, 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 viciously put down after running the government out of, out of Paris for three days and causing the uh, abdication of King Louis XVIII uh, in favor of King Charles X. Um, they also invited survivors of a similar revolution in Brussels in, in November of 1830 that was put down, but caused the creation of the Kingdom of Belgium separate from the Kingdom of the Netherlands. The Netherlands had controlled Belgium before then. And finally, they invited um, um, survivors of, the, of a violent revolution in Poland against Russian rule that lasted for like a year and a half in 1830, 1830 and 1831 and had organized armies of revolutionaries fighting the organized armies of the Russians. It was, it was violently suppressed. And they invited uh, these survivors as special guests that were trotted out every time there was a speech or a, a lecture or a rally. And people were given um, uh, information about uh, uh, how, to, how, to, how to do a revolution is what they were uh, essentially told. The other th important thing about the Hambach Fest is you see these flags. Uh, yellow, this is supposed to be red in the middle, and black. If you remember the Lutzow's Freikorps uh, uniforms, they were all black with red bunting down, the mid, down uh, on the collar and as a mark of insignia on the sleeves, and then yellow brass buttons down the, the front. And the present government of Germany, including also the, Weim the Weimar Republic after World War I, uh, honors the Lutzow's Freikorps every day when they raise the flag over German office buildings. Um, German children are taught uh, the, 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 the phrase, out of the blackness of servitude, the blood of martyrs has brought us to the joyous sunlight of freedom. Um, many, um, one uh, of the attendees of uh, the uh, Hambach Fest was a student at, in Frankfurt who would later write after being uh, the first Republican Lieutenant Governor of the state of Illinois 
in his memoirs would write that the Hambach Fest speakers were so dynamic, they electrified the, uh, the people present. Um, did Linheimer attend the Hambach Fest? We don't know. Nobody knows. He never mentioned it. I don't think there's any record of it. But we do know a number of people who attended. For one, George Bunsen, Linheimer's boss, attended the Hambach Fest along with his younger brother, Gustav. Gustav Bunsen. And when they got back to uh, 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 Frankfurt, they kept in touch with about 500 people that had attended the Hambach Fest, most of them students and teachers, but also people from other walks of life. And they began to analyze the Paris Revolution, the Brussels Revolution, and the Polish Revolution. What went wrong? What, the, what could have been done better? And they began to plot their own violent revolution. Their plan was to seize the Frankfurt Mint that coined all the different coinages uh, used in the 41 different states and also had a, a good amount of gold and silver bullion lying around and, had, and was serving as essentially as the national treasury for the German Confederation. Once they seized the uh, uh, Frankfurt Mint, they, were, they would march on the palace where the Federal Assembly uh, lived and did their work and take all of the uh, delegates hostage and put out a call for the revolutions to start all over the German Confederation. They planned their uh, attack on Feb April 3rd, 1833. And the only hindrance was a very small guard tower or sentry post next to the entrance to the Frankfurt Mint. But the German, the Frankfurt police knew everything that was going to happen. Everybody in town knew what was going to be, ha be happening because they were, the conspirators were too loose with their talk. There was even a crowd of spectators who assembled to watch the revolution get started. Um, in all, uh, nine people were killed. Six of them were uh, Frankfurt policemen, one bystander and two insurrectionists. Uh, 24 were injured. Uh, it started and stopped within 30 minutes. It was all over. The insurrectionists fled as best they could. Uh, those who decided to stop by their apartments or their homes were arrested when they got there because the police knew who they were and where they lived. Um, only those that headed straight for the gates um, got out alive. Some of them had to uh, even uh, escape in disguise. Since even though the Frankfurt police had everything under, under control, the Federal Assembly delegates were not pleased, especially when they found out that they were the next in line to be uh, uh, kidnapped and held hostage. So what they did was they uh, revoked the free city status of the city of Frankfurt. It was no longer going to be self-governing. They directed it, it be annexed to the uh, Grand Duchy of Hessen uh, and ordered the Grand Duke thereof to send in Hessian troops to restore order, which he did, as well as he shut down the Bunsen Institute entirely putting everybody out of work, including Lindheimer. The Hessian military kept meticulous records uh, on investigations, charges brought, uh, outcome of trials, sentences passed, and sentences carried out. In total, 39 people were sentenced to death for high treason for their uh, actions in the uh, storming of the guard table. That, that's what guard tower, that's what Wachensturm means. Um, that many executions would have probably caused uh, uh, uprisings all over the German Confederation. So the Federal Assembly had second thoughts and commuted the uh, death sentences of everyone who was present at their trial uh, for high treason to life imprisonment. But those who were not present who had already escaped and their trial was held in absentia, 
they let those death sentences stand just to make certain they never came back. So George uh, Bunsen and his uh, brother Gustav for the rest of their lives were under um, uh, threat of, of uh, death sentence if they returned to Germany. I forgot to tell you, Gustav Bunsen, George's younger brother, uh, became a personal aide to General Sam Houston and would die during the Texas Revolution. Did Linheimer participate in this insurrection? Undoubtedly not. Was he sympathetic toward it? Probably. Was he investigated about it? Don't know. The records of the Hessian military uh, have survived. They're in the, uh, a uh, history museum in Frankfurt, but I'm not aware that any indexer has included the name Linheimer on any of the documents kept by the Hessian military. Nevertheless, by the next January, we find Ferdinand Linheimer in America, making his way westward from New York to Belleville, Illinois. Before you ask why Belleville, Illinois, let me back up. Um, Linheimer never spoke about his reasons or wrote about his reasons for leaving his homeland. Uh, some years after his death, his eldest son in giving a, a newspaper interview in New Braunfels indicated that he left his homeland because of family strife, family discord, family disagreement, argument, however you want to uh, translate the word. There was family strife between him and his older brothers. There was uh, evidence that Linheimer um, did receive a patrimony um, before coming to America, and that's what he lived on. Why Belleville, Illinois? Well, Belleville, Illinois is the county seat of St. Clair County, Illinois. Um, but uh, George Bunsen wasn't in Belleville yet. It wouldn't, come, wouldn't arrive for another year. So the immediate cause for Linheimer going to Belleville was his friend, George Engelman, who was living on a farm of Engelman's uncle, just a few miles outside of Belleville. And by summer, uh, Linheimer is in a cabin on the farm of Engelman's uncle uh, with seven other expatriates, uh, at least one of which was a participant who was wounded at the uh, storming of the guardhouse. He was the one who would later become a uh, Republican Lieutenant Governor of Illinois. Uh, and the, the, the eight men in the cabin took their, their uh, meals at the main farmhouse. And Linheimer's uncle's eldest son, uh, Theodore, is that right? Uh, was also under uh, a, a death sentence from the results of the storming of the guardhouse because he was the one who gave the signal to, to attack. So there's still connections with uh, insurrection here uh, in Belleville. By the fall of 1834, this is the summer of 1834, he's in the cabin. By the fall of 1834, Linheimer and five other men from the cabin journeyed south to New Orleans with the intent of coming to Texas. But once in New Orleans, they found that the overland route from New Orleans to Texas was too dangerous. There had been a number of Indian deprivation, depredations. So that caused three of the party to turn back and it left uh, Linheimer and two companions, uh, two brothers, Otto and Friedrich Otto. Now let me think just a minute. Your last name was Friedrich. Otto and Edward Friedrichs. Um, to um, uh, catch a ship across the Gulf to Veracruz, from which point they intended to journey inland to uh, Mexico City, and then <clears throat> try to hitch a ride with a caravan of trade goods heading northward to San Antonio along an inland route that was much more well-known and well-guarded and safer. Now, this painting was uh, done uh, about four years before Linheimer got to Veracruz. Uh, Veracruz is in the background on the, on the right. Where is my pointer? Are you still working pointer? My pointer is not working. There we go, I hope. Uh, Veracruz is in the background on the right here. 
uh, it does not have a natural harbor. Uh, Lynn Harbor describes this in this book. Uh, the biggest chapter in the book is my travel and sojourn in Mexico. Uh, Veracruz sits right on the beach. Offshore, there is an island with deep water around it, and they built a, uh, a, a, a castle or a fortress on the island, and the ocean-going ships would tie up to giant metal rings in the foundations of the, of the, of the castle. Um, cargo and passengers would be offloaded to smaller ships that would sail into the beach. You would get your feet wet getting off at the beach at Veracruz where they would you know, discharge the cargo and, and uh, passengers and pick up new passenger and cargo for other ships. Lindheimer in his book described everything you see in this picture. Uh, a rich person in a sedan chair with uh, finely uh, uh, clothed attendants, a man with a mule train carrying uh, uh, cargo to somewhere on, on the inland. The fact that the the main road to uh, Mexico City ran along the beach for several miles to the north of town before uh, it turned inland. Uh, he described uh, uh, native people selling fruit along the side of the road to passersby. He talked about the fast riding uh, post rider on a fast horse. Uh, so everything is in is uh, in Lindheimer's book, carefully described. Um, they never got to Mexico City. Instead, they stopped at a very small German colony that operated two sugarcane plantations and a coffee plantation on the northern flank of this mountain. This is called Pico de Orizaba. Um, it's the third highest peak in North America at over 18,000 feet and the highest point in Mexico. At 17 degrees north latitude, it's well within the tropics, but as you can see, at wintertime, it is well covered with snow. And Lindheimer describes uh, the, the climate and the vegetation zones of eastern Mexico as the Tierra Caliente along the coast near Veracruz, the Tierra Templada, where the German colony was located on the northern flank to the right, and then the Tierra Fria up here to the north. When the uh, snows melt in the summer times, there's just a, there's just a small area of, of permanent ice, uh, at least in until not too recently, uh, near the peak of the, of the volcano. Um, and all the rest that you see that's covered with white is above tree line, and it's essentially alpine tundra. This is alpine tundra in the tropics. Um, and it's, it's one of the things that botanists just love. They go crazy over. Uh, I'm trying to think what my next. OK. Um, during the time he was in Mexico, uh, he lived either on one of the plantations or he lived by himself. If he lived by himself, he had a small cabin with a, a, a banana trees behind it. And if he needed something from the from the plantation store and needed some cash, he would cut off, uh, cut down a banana plant and carry the inflorescence out to the road and he would peddle uh, bananas to passersby on the road. At another time, he was a uh, uh, manager of the rum distillery, which is one of the only two forms of product that the sugarcane plantation could produce. One was granulated sugar uh, and the other was rum. And finally, uh, for a, a brief period toward the end uh, in 1835, uh, he was uh, helping the manager, the owner of the coffee plantation to manage the, the, his workers on, a, on the plantation. Toward the end of 1835, uh, Lindheimer started hearing about the revolution in Texas. Santa Ana had declared himself dictator, had uh, uh, suspended laws passed under the old constitution. He had, he had uh, violently and ruthlessly put down a, a, a revolution in Zacatecas. And he was getting ready to march northward to put down the revolution in Texas. Uh, the newspapers referred to uh, Santa Ana as probably the Napoleon of the North. And Lindheimer got a great deal of joy out of that phrase, uh, considering uh, the fact that Napoleon you know, uh, tried to invade Russia and failed. 
about this, at this time, Lindheimer sold everything he had, rushed to Veracruz to try to catch the first boat to Texas to join the revolution and to help uh, Texans win their independence. The boat that he found uh, uh, strayed off course and ran aground near the mouth of Mobile Bay in Alabama. Uh, Lindheimer had to swim ashore, nobody was hurt, but uh, Lindheimer joined a volunteer company of Alabamans coming to the rescue of the Texans. Uh, in essence, he became a mercenary. Uh, when they got to Texas, they were stationed in Galveston for a while. When they were ordered to come north to San Jacinto, they arrived after the battle. So they never saw any direct com combat. But he did stay with the Texas Army and became a, uh, a soldier for 18 months in Texas. He took his pay in the form of land near the town of Industry, northwest of Houston, because there were other German farmers in the area. Now, this particular period of time, this would be 36, 37, 37 and later, uh, is kind of lost in Lindheimer's biographies. Uh, one source says said that he found that he uh, was not a very good farmer. I just don't believe that at all. Uh, he was a very good botanist and a very good uh, farmer when he was living in New Braunfels. Um, another source said that he found that he couldn't make farming pay. And considering all of the factors he talked about on the economics of a sugarcane plantation, the coffee plantation in Mexico, it's easy to see that everything he was growing was also being grown by all his neighbors. So there was no market there. The closest market of any size was Houston. And if it was, and if, if he didn't own mules, or wagons, he couldn't get his produce to market um, in any way that it would be competitive for more locally uh, produced produce. So he was having problems get, uh, making farming pay probably. But every year uh, while he was a farmer, he would go back to St. Louis to visit his friend, George Engelman. And after the first such visit, Engelman returned to Germany since he was not part of the uh, insurrection married his cousin, and when he came back, he stopped in Boston to visit someone he had only known from correspondence, and that was Asa Gray, the America's foremost botanist of the day in the 1830s and 1840s and 50s and beyond. Um, there, Engelman and Gray hatched a plan to uh, use Linheimer to collect Texas plants, ship them to uh, uh, Engelman in St. Louis. Engelman would separate them into sets, ship the sets to Gray in, in Harvard, Boston. And in the meantime, Gray had solicited uh, subscriptions to Lindheimer's plants. People paid money for his plants. And he would ship them out after identifying all of them, putting names on them and publishing himself first. Um, the, all the new species. And it was a very lucrative uh, uh, situation, business situation. And it resulted in some of the, of the most prolific collection of plants that Texas had seen so far. Linheimer was not the first botanist to collect plants for scientific evaluation in Texas. Uh, he did collect these and they were named uh, uh, from his collections. But the other people, that, that preceded him, he, he listed them, he listed four of them, making him the fifth. Uh, but there, we know that now that there was one more, so he was the sixth. Uh, they didn't stay very long. Some of them just stayed a few days. Uh, others stayed a few weeks. The longest one stayed about 14 months. Um, and then they never came back, never returned. Um, Lindheimer's Daisy is, made, is named for Lindheimer. Uh, Lindheimer did not, is not the first one to collect Engelman's daisy. It's based on a different collection, collector's uh, 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 plant. Um, but uh, because they grow together here in Texas, I had to show you Engelman's daisy. Um, Lindheimer's bee balm, uh, Gara, Lindheimer eye, uh, Lindheimer's tephrosia or Lindheimer's hoary pea. I learned it as snow on the prairie. Uh, it may, very well may be snow on the mountain but Lindheimer's collections is the basis for both of those species. Um, 
mountain laurel was not a new species collected by Lenheimer, but the uh, original material from which the species was, uh, was, was named uh, was very uh, scant, very spotty. It was, there was a specimen at the, uh, in the Royal Botanical Gardens of Madrid. There may have been one in Bologna, uh, who knows where else, but people would, would read about uh, Sephora or uh, uh, whatever the new name is today uh, and not know whether what they had in their hands was what it actually was. Lynn Hammer made many collections of mountain laurel uh, Gray identified them, certified that they were mountain laurel, and then shipped them off as, as uh, specimens to people all over the world. Um, same way with agarita, it had been collected earlier by a different uh, uh, collector. Um, but no one, but the very few specimens were in European herbaria. But once Linhammer started collecting, he got it, had specimens shipped all over Europe, all over the United States. And so with the certified identification of Gray, people could be sure what they were looking at was Dagarita. Uh, during his second collecting season, uh, Linheimer encountered Prince Karl of the uh, German uh, Mainzer Adelsverein. And um, the Mainzer Adelsverein was a group of, of noblemen in Germany that was uh, trying to get German immigrants to settle in Texas as the nucleus of a German uh, empire should uh, Germany ever be united. Uh, it didn't work out that way, but anyway, uh, Lindheimer was lucky to encounter the, the first shipment of immigrants to arrive in Texas. This drawing was printed in the Mainzer newspaper. Uh, Mainz is just about 25, 30 miles from Frankfurt. Uh, and it was where the Adelsverein was, was originated. Um, they came to New Braunfels, uh, or they came, let's see, they, Prince Karl uh, of the Adelsverein um, had made arrangements for a temporary encampment of German immigrants at a place called Las Fontanas on the Comal River. Uh, the immigrants liked it there so much they wanted to stay. They formed a town of, and they named it New Braunfels because uh, Prince Carl's uh, home was in the old part of, in old Braunfels in Germany. And Lindheimer asked to join the, the colony in New Braunfels and built a cabin on the Comal. Uh, if you haven't visited it, it's, it's worth it. When my wife and I came uh, back in 73, um, you could just drive up and there was somebody there that could uh, take you through it. Um, after nine years of collecting plants, um, Lindheimer had to find new employment. He had started a family and his oldest son was nearing uh, school age and Lindheimer wanted to be a part of his education. And collecting plants was taking him away from family, uh, his family and home for three months out of the year, three months at a time, six months at a time, and in one instance, nine months. And the following year after the nine months absence, he just picked his family up and moved them to Fredericksburg for the year. Uh, so he didn't have to spend that much time away from them. Uh, in 1850, the United States Census of 1850 determined that New Braunfels was the fourth largest city in Texas after San Antonio, Houston, and Austin. And the Adelsverein that still ran things in New Braunfels had determined that, they, that the citizens of New Braunfels needed a newspaper, a German language newspaper. And they had hired, they had gotten a press and they had hired an editor, but the first editor didn't work out. I don't know why. Uh, and so they called a public meeting and asked, what should we do? And somebody suggested, well, Lenheimer here is educated. He would make a good editor. And so he was, quote, elected, unquote, uh, by uh, unanimous uh, consent. And on Friday, the 12th of November, 1852, um, the uh, volume one, number one, first issue, the Neubraunfelser Zeitung uh, was, was issued. The subtitle and then the masthead 
re reads, Ein Organ der Deutschen Bevölkerung von West Texas. I had trouble with the word organ because it means the same thing in German as, as English, either a musical instrument or a limb of the body or a organ within the body. Um, I eventually decided that what was meant here was a voice of the German settlements of West Texas. Uh, Hiralska gave and edited by Ferdinand Linhammer. Now what I'm showing here, here is not the first issue, uh, but the, the second issue, the week later, November 19th, 1852. The reason I'm showing you the second issue is this is what the first issue looks like. Uh, newsprint is not very uh, permanent. Uh, and uh, so it tears easily. So this is volume one, number one on the 12th of November. Um, and Lindheimer worked as editor of the Neil Brown Zeitung for 20 years, retired and with the help of one of his students from uh, the Benson Institute in Frankfurt, who had later become a world famous surgeon, Dr. Gustav Patsavant. He uh, worked with Passavant and put together a collection of Lenheimer's essays that was published in, in Frankfurt in early 1879. <sighs> so, why, what, would, what do you, will you learn about Lenheimer if you read his book? Well, one of the things that struck me was the changes that Lenheimer uh, saw happening in Texas during his lifetime. Um, one of the things he pointed out that in many parts of the South and uh, starting to uh, show up in East Texas, uh, farmers were noting a uh, noting that fields that 40 years ago produced a crop 100 fold today after 40 years produced the same crop only 20 fold. And Lindheimer said, you cannot plant the same crop on the same field year after year after year without doing something else and expect the same yield. Every time you, you harvest a crop, you're taking away uh, uh, biomass from, from, from the soil. Uh, he pointed to the grape growing region of Germany as the way around the problem of decreasing production year after year. And the grape growing region of Germany is along the Rhine River, the Main River, the, the uh, Moselle and the Neckar on these steep, steep slopes. You wonder how they can even hold soil. Um, and these, uh, these vineyards were ordered to be uh, installed, planted, by Roman emperors in the fourth, third and fourth century AD. And they have been producing equally as well year after year as they did when they first got started. So how, how is this different from the soils across the American South that were being depleted by removing the cotton crop year after year? And Lindheimer points out that every year Barges came down the Mine River and sailed past to the uh, uh, bases of the vineyards along the Rhine and the Moselle and the Necker and discarded their cargo of manure. And I'm certain it meant more, he meant more than just uh, uh, animal manure. I'm certain it contained human manure as well. They dump it at the base of the slopes. They're, the uh, the material is carefully composted by the um, vineyard workers and carried up the hillsides on their backs. Um, this um, sort of struck a chord with me because my grandfather, my father, uh, fought in World War II, and one of the things he hated to do was was digging latrines, and uh, and then filling up and then closing up a latrine after they le after people left. Uh, but once the war was over and all these people, all the soldiers were stationed in places, uh, the, tr the trains had to be pretty big until they could get flowing, running water and flushable toilets. But it wasn't, a, it wasn't the job of the soldiers anymore for maintaining the latrines. 
in Germany, they have a thing called honey wagons. My father talked about, you could smell the honey wagon coming miles away. And the honey wagons kept the latrines cleaned out, kept them functioning for months and months and months at a time without any problems. And that manure was certainly going to uh, be used for growing crops and especially grapes. Um, Lindheimer in the same chapter talked about uh, the, the danger of invasive species. And he describes that when the town of New Braunfels was, was uh, uh, established in 1840s, all the surrounding uh, land was still state owned. It was still public land. And there were prairies in which the, what he called the sugary beard grass. When I looked up the uh, uh, synonyms uh, that for it, it was, he was referring to big blue stem. The big blue stem was so dense that the people of New Braunfels came out to these public land uh, prairies and mowed the big blue stem and bailed it for hay for their livestock. Lindheimer said it only took a few years and in the same fields, instead of growing big blue stem, now only uh, grew cockle burrs, sand burrs, buffalo burrs, uh, sunflowers and hog croton, none of which is uh, edible uh, to any kind of livestock. He said it only took a few years of mowing the grass and carrying it away and not letting it be returned to the soil. That's how fast things change. And that's how long ago, many of these invasive species came in to Texas back in the earliest uh, parts of the uh, settlement. Uh, another aspect of uh, Lindheimer's book uh, sort of went over my head. I didn't realize what it was I was, was translating until the reviewer at the Texas A&M University, who is a zoologist and an ecologist, uh, reviewed the book and he said, this chapter is incredible. Uh, the chapter is Reflections of a Botanist. And what Lindheimer says is that a good botanist, trained botanist, can look at a field or a forest and just knowing a few of the dominant species can discern the workings of the entire community uh, of uh, that occurs there plant and animal and the reviewer says said ecologists had been wrestling with this issue for a long time uh, and it wasn't until uh, the whole idea of an ecosystem had to be proposed and then it had to be debated and then it had to be accepted. It wasn't the, the, the concept of an ecosystem was not proposed until 1929. And it was 10 years before uh, it finally gained acceptance among uh, botanists and biologists. 1929 is 50 years after Lindheimer is writing this chapter on the components of an ecosystem. Lindheimer was 50 years ahead of his time. And the part that I enjoy reading the most. Where did you go? Marker. Where's my marker? I'll find it in a moment. He says, anyone can do this. The botanist can do this just as anyone sitting in the chapel of St. Petersburg where each organ pipe produces only one note but all together form the most beautiful harmony based on only a few plants, a few tones, one can discern the whole chord. And that just, once the reviewer told me this, it just sent chills up down my spine that Lindheimer was that far ahead of his time. 
in writing these things in his book. Um, when we first came to Texas, I was asking people, why isn't someone translated Lindheimer's book? Uh, he's that important of, an, of, of a person to, you know, uh, Texas botany. Why haven't they done it? And one lady from New Braunfels said, well, uh, he didn't say very nice things about Christians or Christianity in his book. And it's true. Lindheimer was very critical of priests, preachers, and uh, rabbis for, um, for despoiling the whole teachings of, 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 of Moses or Mosaic faith and perverting the true, true teachings of Christ. Um, Lindheimer was a very religious person and he constantly is talking about ethics and morality throughout his book. For instance, this is the allegory of Hercules at the crossroads, where there are two women at the crossroads, one of them on the left plainly dressed, saying, if you take this road, you will reach your goal, but it will take a long time and there'll be a lot of effort and it'll be hard going. But once you get there, fame and fortune will be yours. The other woman at the other uh, side of the crossroads was seductively dressed and was saying, take this road, it's easy. It's so easy, you can enjoy all the temptations and vices of, of the world on your way. And as you're going along, you may not even want to get to where you were going originally. You will be so happy with where you are. Uh, Hercules uh, thought about things and he took the hard road. Uh, and that's the lesson from Hercules at the crossroads. Uh, Lindheimer was constantly talking about battles and warriors. Um, and at the Battle of Simpach in the 14th century, the, uh, the, the brand new uh, infant uh, Swiss, independent Swiss states were being uh, attacked by the Duke of Austria, Archduke of Austria, with a huge army. And the pikemen uh, were at such closed ranks that the, uh, uh, the Swiss could not make any headway against them. And they were being pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. And um, then one soldier, I'm trying to remember his name, um, uh, said to his fellow, work, fellow soldiers, take care of my wife and children. And he impaled himself on the Austrian pikes grabbing as many of them as he could as he fell, pulling them down, pulling the shields apart far enough that the Swiss could open, could make a way through into the center of the cordon of, of pikemen. And they started killing and killing and killing. And the Austrian army was defeated. The Grand Duke, Archduke of Austria was killed and virtually every, uh, uh, hereditary monarch that had joined the Archduke on this battle was killed and the Swiss uh, uh, retained their uh, independence. Oh, I wish I could remember his name. Um, this is Marcus Curtius, a Roman soldier who saved Rome from being destroyed by the God of the underworld, who had uh, the, uh, the, the priests had determined that the God of the underworld uh, demanded that the Romans sacrifice the, the one thing that is most valuable to them uh, before they would be saved. Otherwise, he would destroy Rome. And nobody could figure out what that one thing was until Marcus Curtius climbed on his horse and said, you fools, Rome's greatest asset is the bravery of, of its, of its uh, soldiers. And he took his horse and dived into the sulfurous pit and it immediately closed up and Rome was saved. Uh, Lindheimer was also very enamored with, uh, mid, uh, with religious mystics of the Middle Ages. And this uh, one in particular he mentions is Meister Eckhart, who lived between 1260 and 1327 at this church. Uh, I'm not certain where this church is. And if you can read the, uh, the German on the, on the doorway, 
It's from the uh, first chapter of the Gospel of John, verse five. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness is not, does not overcome it. Uh, there's various translations of James, King James in the English uh, standard English version, but uh, I would probably translate the last half as, and the darkness, uh, yeah, does not overcome it, that's what it said. Um, I think a English version, the standard English version is the darkness is not comprehended, does, does not understand it. I, I, I just don't follow that at all. Um, this is Lindheimer. He had a great sense of humor. Uh, he, he once in his chapter on an overview of the flora of Texas, he uh, uh, was describing various plants and he uh, uh, describes uh, a species of garia. G A double R Y A as a. Uh, I've been talking too long. I can't remember my. Uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, hang on. The garia, which occurs here on the sloping sides of walls of ravines, is a very dark green, multi stemmed shrub, four to five feet tall, of gloomy, melancholy appearance. Now, I'm certain most people in the Native Plant Society have tried to key out an unidentified uh, plant in their lives. And uh, most things like uh, leaves lanceolate, leaves uh, 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 ovate. Uh, flowers red, flowers yellow. You know, these are measurable things that you can show uh, in a book. You know, this is what a, uh, a lance leaf, sh leaf sh shape is and an ovate leaf shape is. But can you, can you point me to a diagram or an illustration that would tell me what a gloomy plant was? Or what, what would you do if you came across a couplet in a key? Plants melancholy, plants not melancholy. <laughs> Uh, what I think he was doing here was that the agaria uh, that he was uh, describing in his book had just recently been named after him, uh, Garia Linheimeri. And so uh, he is the, uh, the gloomy, melancholy person in the one of only two photographs known of him. And finally, uh, Linheimer died on the 2nd of December, 1879. He's buried in New Braunfels. You can call Mall Cemetery. You can go and see the grave. Um, and his wife outlived him for several years. And uh, the first chapter is one in this book is really one of the best and most poetic. It's, it's entitled "The uh, Bald Cypress of Texas, of Western Texas," and it's a very short passage. Uh, On the banks, he, he first talks about uh, cypresses growing in the middle of streams. And he says the ones growing in the middle of streams are, are you know, standing their, their, their ground against uh, the, the uh, mechanical laws of fluid dynamics. And here, organic nature triumphs over the laws of the unorganic. Um, but then he said, goes on, on the banks of the same river stand closed ranks of more advantaged trees entwined root within root. One tree strengthens another and the powerful roots together form a braided embankment against the washing waves and a dike against, against the country beyond from which sediments washed down by heavy rains is caught as if by the finest earthen dams. Thus unification ensures added stability and ample nourishment for each individual. Under such conditions, the bald cypress reaches its highest perfection, as does man by analogy. And in such places occur bald cypresses, cypresses from seven or more feet in diameter. Ah, so that's what you can learn from Lindheimer's book. When I first came to Texas, if I had to describe Lindheimer, he was nothing more than a name on a specimen label on an herbarium sheet. If I had to describe him, I would have figured he was 
uh, probably a, a mild-mannered, uh, soft-spoken individual, hardworking, uh, sort of like Clark Kent. Uh, but now that I've translated his book, he was he pictured himself as a sword-wielding warrior against the dark forces of ignorance, blind faith, and tyranny. And one of the best things he ever said about himself in the book is, I intend to conquer the world through knowledge. That was Bert Ferdinand Lindheimer. You don't have to write down these uh, uh, internet addresses exactly. Just go uh, type in Tamu Press. And once you get to the uh, AM Press's uh, homepage, just uh, type in Lindheimer in the search field and you find the book. Same way with Amazon, same way with Barnes and Nobles. So I'm through. Hope you've enjoyed it. Debbie? Thank, thank you so much. Had a lot of wonderful messages um, <laughs> about your presentation while you were still speaking. I don't know if anybody has any questions, if, if you have a moment. Did, did anybody have any questions before we wrap things up? But um, got exceptional presentation, wonderful in-depth look, oh. to, um, and a great history lesson. So, yeah, we truly appreciate. I, I spent more time with, with him than I with, with your with your chapter than I did on any other chapter. So, I, I figured since you're the Lindenheimer chapter, you need to know about him. Well, we very much appreciate it. Thank you so we much. Appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Sure. Very informative. Yep. Uh, and